I am Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation, and I write the blog, The Washington Note. And I'm here with my good friend Juan Cole today, who writes the blog, Informed Comment, at juancole.com, and is the renowned historian at the University of Michigan, who's just published and released a, a must-read book, Engaging the Muslim World. Um, Juan, tell, give us the quick two-minute zinger of why you did this book now and what Americans and, and others who read this book should, should try and get from it. Well, it's an attempt to uh, puncture uh, what I see as a lot of myths about uh, the Muslim world um, and uh, uh, a critique of uh, U.S. policy towards that region in the past few years and also a set of policy prescriptions for going forward with a new uh, relationship uh, in the future. You've got uh, chapters in here on the Wahhabi myth, uh, Muslim activism and Muslim radicalism, Iraq and Islam anxiety, uh, as we discussed earlier today, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And what I see you doing in this, in this excellent book is disaggregating this region, the issues going on, and somewhat as a corrective to what I consider to be the worst thing that came out of the Bush administration was the so-called global war on terror, which became the basket for people, culture, uh, movements of all different sorts and, 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 and made us intellectually lazy. Is, am I on track with what you're trying to that, do? That's exactly right. Uh, there was a, a tendency to make the whole Muslim world into some kind of monolith, the new Soviet Union, and then to tie it all to terrorism and especially to religious terrorism. And so I try to show in the book, you know, that there are lots of Muslim political movements, not violent, don't have anything to do with terrorism, but which get coded uh, in American political discourse as somehow dangerous. I give an example of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which has 88 seats in, in parliament and has no paramilitary, and yet is treated uh, as a pariah by uh, the United States political establishment. Uh, and I, you know, the, the, I, I point out that Wahhabis aren't actually disproportionately involved in terrorism uh, as compared to other branches of, uh, of Islam. Whatever you may think of their policies, uh, of their ideas, uh, certainly it's an authoritarian tradition. But it's it, you know the, the the allegation is that it is a terrorist tradition, and this is simply not true. Well, Barack Obama, his uh, first formal uh, press discussion was with Al Arabiya. Uh, the first move he did within two days of moving into the White House was to appoint George Mitchell to to work on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Uh, he gave a effusive, uh, uh, very positive New Year's greeting to the Iranian people on the on the occasion of their New Year. Are these all good moves by Obama? Do they show a very different, and, and are they enough? Well, I think they're excellent moves. Uh, it's it's important that he uh, address uh, Muslim publics as he did on Al Arabiya. Although Al Arabiya probably has about nine percent of the viewership, and uh, he would have gotten a bigger. Uh, a bigger viewership on Al Jazeera. Uh, so he should do Al Jazeera next. He, he should definitely yeah. do Al Jazeera. And um, uh, if he wants to be taken seriously, I, I think that's uh, that's going to be necessary. Uh, the uh, address to the Iranian public and government uh, was, I think, uh, well-crafted, although it did have a few paternalistic parts in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the Iranian response was a wait-and-see attitude. Uh, they, I think they liked some of what they heard, but they want to see if it's actually implemented in concrete policy. And here's the issue, is that a lot of what Obama has done so far is on the realm of symbol. And so he has to move beyond that to actual concrete uh, steps in order to... Substantive policy. Substantive. When you talk about engaging the Muslim world, where for you do you think the Israel-Palestine conflict rests in that? Should that be a very high priority for us? Should it be a moderate priority? Should it be uh, uh, something we fake and just never really solve, you know, keeping this Middle East peace business humming along for decades ahead? Well, the successes the United States has had in mediating an Arab-Israeli peace process have all come at particular junctures where the, the, the players are lined up and, and want something. So Jimmy Carter uh, mediated between Egypt and Israel after Egypt had had a, a relatively successful war with Israel. That is to say, mm -hmm. they, they crossed the canal, they got into the Sinai, uh, they showed that they weren't wimps. I think the Israelis were genuinely frightened uh, at that point and were much more willing to make a deal. And the Egyptians uh, uh, had gotten over the humiliation of 1967 and they were willing to make a deal. 
I, I just fear that the stars are not aligned for Obama at, at, to, to have any similar success, uh, certainly in the next four years. Uh, the, the government coming in in Israel is extremely right-wing, extremely obstreperous, very much devoted to continued colonization of the West Bank, uh, and to uh, throttling the people of Gaza. The, um, the Palestinians are divided. Uh, you would have to dissolve the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority and, and, and have new elections to, I mean, hope to have a, an interlocutor even. Uh, and so things don't look good on that front. And when things don't look good on a particular front, then you have to go for the Big Bang elsewhere. So I think it's much more likely that Obama could get some breakthroughs on uh, the Iran front uh, and could get uh, successfully out of Iraq, nothing is guaranteed in these things, uh, than it is that he is likely to make big progress on the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's fascinating to me that you see um, the possibility of progress in Iran. I, I guess I would associate myself with Big Brzezinski, um, who thinks that now all the illusions have been removed on the Palestinian side, all illusions have been removed on the Israeli side. Both have shown themselves completely unable to achieve terms. Uh, and thus, that then brings in the reason why you need the Saudis, Jordanians, Egyptians, Europeans, Russians, and Americans essentially to be the deal makers and say, here's your deal, uh, and pass it on. So it'll be interesting to see how that comes up. Uh, any last thoughts? Well, I, I think that we're at a turning point in American history uh, and that our relationship to the Muslim world is going to be very much part of our future. We've got to get it right. A lot of people keep saying that well, we'll have energy independence, uh, we won't need the Middle East, and so forth. Uh, every evidence is that we will be more dependent on that region uh, for hydrocarbons in the coming decades than we ever were before, uh, that we'll be depending on the region for, uh, even Europe will depend on the region heavily for a labor pool. Uh, are, are we're going to be more and more entangled with the Muslim world. Uh, and moreover, uh, there's going to be severe competition for uh, their resources, their, uh, their contributions from China, India, uh, Russia, and so the United States can't just assume that it has the Muslim world in its back pocket. It's going to have to compete for their affections, and uh, we're going to need a whole different set of policies if we're going to succeed in winning hearts and minds on that front. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. As I mentioned earlier, I was at a dinner with Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, last night, and she said and admitted that one of the biggest stumbling blocks in her during her tenure and since has been the collective ignorance of this town, of Washington, D.C., about the Muslim world, about Islam, um, and, and that we need an Islam 101. And so I look forward to reading the next half of the book as I'm halfway through it. Uh, I want to thank you, Juan, because you're, you're really one of the single most important interpreters of this world for us. So thanks very much. Thanks a million, Steve. I appreciate it.